I received a, a gift, Christmas gift, from my younger sister. She, uh, I think, had been giving me a gift every year, but it was always the same thing. I don't know if you remember these, but there were these little boxes of chocolates, but this size, we called them willow packs. Uh, they were a staple of uh, Christmas in the 80s and 90s, and every year, my favorite was the macaroons, so she would always give me a box of those macaroons. So when I saw the, the gift, I instantly thought that's what it was. But when I shook it, it didn't sound like a box of macaroons, and so I was instantly intrigued as to, as to what this gift might be, something different this year. So finally, Christmas morning came, it was time to open her present from her to me, and I opened it, and what was inside? It was a box of macaroons. But why didn't it sound like a box of macaroons? Well, apparently it had been set on something hot, and all of the chocolate had melted together, and so it was now one big blob of chocolate. So it was even, you know, not that that was a bad gift, but it was a worse gift than the box of macaroons that I wouldn't have really been excited about. So I was not impressed. I instantly just threw it in the garbage. I didn't bother to eat that big blob of, of chocolate. So it went from an intriguing gift to a, a very disappointing Christmas gift. Uh, Christmas morning, Christmas day can often be a day of, of surprises. Usually they're good surprises, but occasionally there are those bad surprises. Now, the story of Christ's birth is a story full of surprises. And we find one of those surprises in Matthew chapter 2. Uh, the wise men expected the king of the Jews to be born in Jerusalem. But they were surprised to discover that he actually was born in the little town of Bethlehem. What we expect God to do so often isn't what he chooses to do. We have these expectations, but God often works in different ways. And that is true in many ways when it comes to the birth of Christ. Not just where he was born, but so much more. So much is surprising. Now, if I had a do-over for this series on Christmas according to the Minor Prophets, I would have taken these passages from the Minor Prophets in the exact opposite order. You may have noticed we're working backwards in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, at the beginning of chapter 2, this week we were in verses 13 through 18 last week, and then the first week we were talking about John the Baptist, and he's mentioned in chapter 3. So we kind of went through it backwards, made sense at the time when I was planning this, but uh, would have done it a different way. But this is the way we did it, so uh, we're going to look at Micah's prophecy this morning regarding the birth of the Christ. So the wise men arrive in Jerusalem asking, where is he who is to be born king of the Jews? And Herod gathers all of the chief priests and scribes, the experts. He asks them, where is the Christ supposed to be born? And their answer is, in Bethlehem of Judea. And then they quote the prophet Micah, who 700 years earlier had written, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. As we'll see in a moment, that's not an exact quote from Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But that's the, the gist of what Micah foretold. Now, why would, why would God choose Bethlehem to be the place where the Christ would be born? Why is Bethlehem significant? Why was Jesus born there? Born there? Was it just a random place, or was there significance behind it? 
could go all the way back to 1 Samuel chapter 16. The prophet Samuel has been told by God that God has rejected Saul, the first king of Israel. He's going to choose a new king, and he's going to choose one of Jesse's sons. Now, where does Jesse live? He lives in Bethlehem. And here's another story where God does something in an unexpected way. He surprises Samuel, or he doesn't, I guess, choose in the way that Samuel would have chosen when it came to the next king of Israel. Going down to verse 6, he says, When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man sees on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab, made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest. Behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send him, send and get him, for he will, we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. So who was this? Not actually named here until, well, the part that I didn't read. But it was probably the most famous king of Israel, David. David. David was from Bethlehem. In Luke chapter 2, Bethlehem is called the city of David. Really, we wouldn't classify it as a city. It was a little place. Uh, But that's where David was from. And so that's the significance of the town of Bethlehem. That's where David was from. It was his hometown. And and Jesus would be an heir to David's throne. Matthew chapter 1 verse 6 speaks of this. Luke chapters 1 and 2 speak of this as well. And so what we see about David, and we see it right here, without really getting into, into much of his story, is that David was a shepherd who became a king. So remember that. David was a shepherd who became a king. Now let's go back to Micah. I guess it would be forward now if you're still in First Samuel. But Micah chapter 5. So we go to one of the minor prophets. This is the prophet, as I said, that the chief priests and the scribes quoted when Herod asked them, where is the Christ, the king of the Jews, to be born? And they quote Micah 5, verse 2. But let's start at verse 1. Micah chapter 5, verse 1. Right near the back of the Old Testament. might be a difficult one to find. But Micah chapter 5, verse 1 says... Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. So this is written during really a dark time in Judah's history. The people of Judah are under attack. Now some say it's the Assyrians, others say it's the Babylonians. Either way, It's a time of fear. A powerful army has, has come against them, and they're not really able to muster up the kind of army that will be able to defeat their enemy who is attacking them. And talks about the ruler or the judge of Israel being humiliated here. Their king is being humiliated by this 
other army. And so the people, the people need really a, a message of hope. And so God, through the prophet Micah, gives them that message of hope. Now, it's not something that really will change things for another seven years, 700 years, but still it's a message that says that God has not forgotten about them, that he will one day fulfill uh, the promise that he has made to them, that there will be uh, the Christ or the Messiah to come, their king. Look at, look at verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth is from of old, from ancient days. Last part, probably, there is disagreement, but probably refers back to the ancient line of David. Now, there are, as I said, some differences between Micah 5.2 and Matthew 2.5, where the scribes and the Pharisees are said to quote this verse. Probably what happened was Micah, sorry, Matthew added his own editorial comments to the verse, didn't really change the meaning, but updated them in light of what had happened. So there's differences Micah says, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, while Matthew says, O Bethlehem in the land of Judah. Judah is actually mentioned in Micah 5 too, as well, but uh, probably wants to connect it with the tribe of Judah. And really, this is meant in both uh, versions to really distinguish it from another city called, Be- uh, another town called Bethlehem. So there were two Bethlehems, so this is Bethlehem, Ephrathah, or Bethlehem in the land of Judah. The same place. Uh, Micah says, too little to be among the clans of Judah. So again, a seemingly insignificant place, a little town. Yes, David was from there, but still, it wasn't very a very important place. Matthew says, by no means least among the rulers of Judah. So it was a small place, but since the prophecy of Micah, it's no longer seen as unimportant. So that's why he adds or changes it in that way. And Matthew also adds at the end, who will shepherd my people Israel, which verse 4 in Micah 5 talks about, probably also alludes to 2 Samuel 5 too, where we have this almost uh, verbatim in that verse, speaking of David, who would shepherd God's people, Israel. Again, David was a shepherd who became a king. Uh, Jesus was a descendant of David, physically speaking. Joseph, his legal father, we know, was a descendant of David. That's why he went to Bethlehem to be registered. So the king to be born in Bethlehem, if you connect Micah chapter 5 with Matthew chapter 2. And this was the interpretation of both Christians and Jews, that this prophecy, Micah 5, 2, spoke of the Christ. And of course, we believe that the Christ or the Messiah is Jesus. So the king to be born in Bethlehem would be Jesus. He was the one Israel was waiting for. He was their hope. Continuing on through a few more verses in Micah 5, verse 3, Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. We might connect that with Mary, though probably that refers to the whole nation of Israel would give birth uh, in that sense to the Messiah, then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Stop there. The Old Testament prophets 
they didn't realize that there would be two comings of the Christ. You know, we're celebrating Advent this month. And Advent is really supposed to celebrate the two Advents. Advent means coming. The two Advents of Christ. He came the first time. He was born in Bethlehem. Uh, we're remembering that story uh, at Christmas time. Uh, but Advent also looks ahead to his second coming. He said, I'm coming again. But the Old Testament prophets, they didn't really understand this. They only saw really one coming. It was sort of like if you look off in the distance and you see two mountain peaks, they would see the two mountain peaks of prophecy. They would see the first coming and the second coming. And when you're off, when you're a ways away from two mountain peaks, it looks like the first and the second are pretty much close together. But if you were to go and you were to climb up on the first peak, you would see that there is a great valley in between the first and second mountain peak. And so the prophets, they missed that big valley in between the first and the second coming. It's all seemed like one event to them. They didn't see what came in between. So they didn't see the suffering of Christ for the most part. You know, there is that great chapter in Isaiah, chapter 53, that speaks of Christ's suffering on behalf of others. But for the most part, uh, they saw it all as, as one event, the first and second coming. It just seemed like that all of this was happening at once. It, they didn't see the suffering, just like you can't see the valley in between two mountain peaks when you're off looking from a distance. You know, that's clearly seen in, in Luke chapter 24 after the crucifixion of Jesus. We have uh, two unnamed disciples who are traveling from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and they're discouraged. And what's amazing is that Jesus, the risen Jesus, appears to them, though they are kept from realizing that it is actually him. And he asks them about what has happened in Jerusalem. They're amazed that he doesn't know what has happened. And they say to him, speaking of Jesus, we, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. So when they looked at the Old Testament scriptures, which of course was all they had at that point, uh, they didn't see the suffering of the Christ. They thought, well, I guess Jesus really wasn't the Christ. We had hoped that he would redeem Israel, but now he's dead. And even though they had heard reports of a resurrection or an empty tomb, uh, they didn't believe it. And Jesus replied to them, in verse 26, Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And so he took them through the scriptures and showed them all the things that they had missed. And I don't know everything he told them, but he would have pointed out that this shows that the Christ needed to suffer first, and then would come the glory. That's what the Old Testament prophets really didn't see, or the people of Jesus' day didn't see. They didn't see that valley in between. Again, that was a surprise. God did something in a way that they didn't expect. They didn't expect the suffering. They only expected the glory. Micah 5 tells us, and Matthew 2 tells us this as well, is that Jesus is both a king and a shepherd. You know, he's the king of kings. But he's also a shepherd in the sense that he cares for his people. He's not just a king who rules over his people. He's a shepherd who knows his sheep, who cares for his sheep. And he says in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And so he's a, he's a king who gave his life for his people. 
another surprise when it comes to the story of the birth and life of Christ. The people just saw or expected glory. They didn't expect suffering. They didn't expect a king who would suffer and die for sins. And so the life of Jesus included many surprises. We see one here this morning that he was born in Bethlehem, surprising the wise men who expected him to be born in Jerusalem, the capital city. The first people to be told about the birth of Jesus was lowly shepherds. You know, this display over here kind of captures probably the two, maybe the two greatest surprises when it comes to Jesus that really speak of the humility and the love that he has. That he was laid in a manger, humbly coming into this world, a feeding trough for animals. There was no great event that wasn't proclaimed that he, other than to the, the shepherds that he had been born, no great announcement from heaven, uh, simply born without really anyone knowing and being laid in a manger, and then eventually dying on a cross. In those days, the most humiliating awful way to die. And we could go through the story of of Christ and come up with so many surprises when it comes to how he came and and what he did, what he said. But the manger and the cross really, really sum up what the life of Jesus was all about. A king who gave his life for His people. And if you take a a closer look at the baby in the manger and the man on the cross, you'll find the biggest surprise of all that not only was he a king, born the king of the Jews, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, the sign said over the cross. Not only was he a king, But what we see if we look closely at Scripture is that he was God in human flesh. That that is God in that manger, on that cross. An indescribable humility, an unmeasurable love. The baby born in Bethlehem, the man crucified in Jerusalem, was God in human flesh. Probably the greatest surprise of all. A surprising, an amazing, a shocking humility and love. And Jesus did this because he cares about us. We matter to him. He loves us. He invites each one of us to you know, acknowledge our need of him, that we are in need of reconciliation with God, that we need to be made right with God. We need our sins forgiven, and that's why Jesus died on that cross. And so he invites us to humble ourselves and to respond to his love and to give our lives to him, trusting in what Jesus did for us through his death on the cross. So I invite you, I encourage you to, if you have not, to to turn to Christ, the one who is so humble, the one who is so loving, and to give yourself to him.